Thank you very much. You, you, uh, I appreciate your, your, uh, your interest in public safety uh, and, and calling yourself the, uh, the safety commissioner, and I, I appreciate you addressing that. Safety has become an issue. Um, you talked about attorneys that uh, hiring, hiring safety attorneys. Um, I want to kind of just also create another context. Um, your annual budget, about 307 million. Uh, this legislature invests uh, our budget for the UCs out of uh, the state budget is about 300 million. Just to create a context, I mean that's those that's what we invest in education. And the UCs are always under the gun in terms of not investing enough. It, it creates an uh, impact in. Uh, in, in student fees, and there are a lot of pressures working on us. I know that you operate, operate under an enterprise fund, but still those are $307 million uh, from ratepayers in our state. That's quite a considerable sum of money. And I think, uh, you know, I served on the Coastal Commission, and our budget was about $30 million for a statewide agency that uh, had a you know, meetings that were distributed across the state. Um, I, I think you have a lot more resources than both the, the UC system and, you know, and the Coastal Commission. And, you know, uh, so I, I can see how you have room to conduct meetings throughout the state. You have room to address uh, safety issues. How much of the, your budget is is dedicated to those efforts? Let's talk about safety. What what do you think? How, how much of you that are you going to put to addressing safety concerns? I, I I would I don't know that I can actually put it in budget figures, but about forty percent of our staff works on safety issues in one way or another. So I'll give you an example. We inspect every railroad crossing twice a year to make sure that the arms and the bells work and that the sensors actually track. Um, and as we all know, that's still not enough to actually make protect people who use the grade level crossings. The, the, there's still always confusion. There's always somebody who drives around the, the arms. But they also inspect every foot of track once a year. And a lot of them go out with little micrometers to measure the crown of the rail to see if it's getting too thin. They're looking for cracks. And then they also spot check the wheels on trains. And so either, if you think about it, there's not an easy way to do that without having uh, somebody who actually goes out and looks. Now there are some technologies out there that the railroad industry is using and that the Federal Railway Administration uses to actually to, to be able to do this more efficiently in terms of human resources. But they still need people to go out and audit to see whether the information they're getting is correct. And they need to audit the utility databases to make sure that they're getting good information. So uh, this is going to be a, it's, it's going to be like Caltrans in that there's just a lot of people who go out and do things physically. Um, I don't think, to be honest with you, that we have enough to do some of the things that we traditionally have done when the, when the, um, commercial trucking industry got deregulated about 15 years ago. We lost 150 of our, um, our, uh, um, our field people. And these are the folks who actually went out with the CHP to do uh, uh, spot checks and truck stops and to, to actually um, check to make sure whether people are properly licensed and insured. They actually uh, not only gave us troops to cover some of the other um, vehicle um, regulation stuff that we did, but they were also the core, I think, of our culture of investigation as opposed to our culture of, uh, of policy regulation. And they knew how to do field interrogations. They actually could collect evidence in the field. They were working, used to working with law enforcement. That gave a certain kind of toughness and rigor to their posture. And I think we're recovering that. I can point to a number of really good citation uh, that w programs that we now have in place, thanks to Senator Hill, our gas and electric safety programs actually have started to produce real citations that the utilities are starting to respond to. 
<clears throat> but I, I would say that when we're faced with the challenge of dealing with uh, with the the, the uh, transfer net, transportation uh, net companies, I don't think we got the troops to actually go out and do what some cities do for taxis. We're a long way away from that. A you long, know, long way from it. We, we had uh, even, you know, going in the pa past years, one of the measurements of, of, uh, of creating a, a business-friendly environment is the ability to settle disputes between business people. And in the past years, when we reduced funding to the courts because of our budget problems, that was one of the biggest concerns that uh, the litigation process was extended and it was costing people money in, in getting through that process and eventually seeing a return of, of their losses. Um, you haven't had that problem that we've had with other departments. Your budget has been fairly uh, stable. But based on information on your website, as of the latest update on February 17, there were 247 open proceedings over 80 of which are over 18 months old and 40 that are over 1,000 days old. And it's uh, a big complaint that we hear from people that are before the PUC trying to get uh, a decision on either a rates issue or an approval issue that they seem to be stuck in a limbo with no real explanation why. Is, are you looking into that matter and finding a way to streamline your decision-making process to give well, people a, an answer sooner than later. I share their frustration, but rather than answer, I'm gonna to turn to, to our executive director. He, as the chief ALJ, he actually started working on this over the last year, and uh, it's one of the reasons why I, I was eager to have him step in as our, our executive Very director, well. because he made progress there. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, senators. Um, as a Chief ALJ, what I wanted to do is I wanted to create a management tool that would help the judges uh, focus on cases and get them resolved. I also thought it made sense to just transparently report it on the website so that uh, people like yourself exercising oversight uh, could see what was going on. And so rather than just uh, uh, focus on compliance with extension orders and things like that, we just have a straight up, when did the case start? When did the case end? Now, uh, we just do that. We update it each month. I know when we went public in September, the first thing we managed to do, I think we managed to close 29 proceedings in December that were open for more than three years. So uh, by focusing on this, I believe, again, I think we are moving in, in, in the right direction. Um, I also have to tell you that as a manager, I sat down with each judge that had proceeding open for more than two years and found out what the reason was. Uh, it's, it's a large agency and there are a lot of different reasons. Uh, sometimes it was waiting for an environmental impact report. Uh, another a proceeding was open for three years. It was a rail safety proceeding. And just before it began to close, uh, there was a, uh, uh, a fatal accident on a bar track uh, dealing with uh, a repair person. And so the proceeding was kept open for yet another year in order to get the report uh, of the uh, Federal Transportation Agency on the safety issue. So uh, on the website, if you see where I, I, I introduced it, I had a quote from Tolstoy uh, with all happy families are alike and all unhappy families are unhappy in their own way. Uh, that unfortunately is really true uh, for these different proceedings, and it's what the judges are doing now to actively manage it. I think this is a first step in the right direction. Uh, I'm glad you're asking the questions because these are the questions to ask. How do we get those things better? Uh, I think there's two types of answers. Uh, there's some that uh, the commissioner, uh, President Picker, is looking at, which is structural changes. And what I'm looking at is managerial changes. What can be done to hold judges accountable and uh, move those proceedings along in the short run. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's all there is. I do want to just comment that the, that the, that the uh, tracking tool that you found on our website actually is somewhat different than our annual report to the legislature, which discusses uh, um, proceedings and whether they are past their deadline. 
we as a commission, I think, in past have, have employed a tactic where we extend the deadlines so that no proceeding really is generally behind, be, beyond their deadlines. But I think that you use something that's probably a different metric and probably a truer statement of what the problem is. But I'd like you to consider that when, what, sometimes uh, when you create a process, uh, sometimes there's, a, there's a, an agreement between both parties that it needs to be extended simply when it's about gathering data or, or allowing the applicant more time to fulfill the requirements of, of uh, the, the requirements to put before them. But I think the establishment of a, of a process is, is very important to put into place so that people understand that there, there is a certain level of expectation and that on one end, they're, they're, if they comply with providing all the information that's requested of them, that eventually there'll be a, a timely review of all their materials and a timely decision. And I think uh, that's, that's the best that we can expect, but that requires you to kind of, uh, you know, organize around a, a, a process that is uh, in the public's interest, that they have the ability to participate in that process, but also uh, creates a, a good environment for the people applying that they know that they have a certain window to comply with the rules. And, and it's, it's harder when you're a, a business to, to make a certain budget to go through a process. I mean, it, it can very well break you, and we don't want to create that environment. I, want, I have one more budget question. It deals with outside counsel. You mentioned you uh, hire, hired legal counsel in the area of safety. But uh, it also has uh, come to my attention that the CPUC has retained legal counsel to represent the commission on ongoing criminal proceedings. And we, it, these are um, legal counsel that's really not looking specifically whether you're in violation of a law or looking at how to com you know, be consistent with legal requirements, but rather criminal a criminal element, and I know that I've never seen a, uh, a city specifically hire a city or an agency, government agency or commission or an, anyone in particular hire an attorney to represent them on a criminal matter without it being specifically for an individual. And um, that is not very clear with the reason why this council was uh, retained. So um, I'd like to know what is, how, how is that possible for you to retain somebody specifically to represent you on a criminal matter when the, uh, the commission itself is not somebody that commits a criminal matter. Usually it's a person that commits a criminal violation. And uh, what's the authority to do that? I mean, term, uh, do you have the authority to actually hire? And we're talking about a $307 million budget. I don't remember allocating money for uh, criminal representation of the PUC. Uh, and so it seems very uh, odd to me though, that you would hire a criminal uh, attorney. Um, is there somebody pr that is being represented uh, by this attorney? Is the attorney hired to represent an individual uh, per se? And how is the PUC paying for that? Is that coming from the PUC's funds? What is the cost? How much has uh, been allocated? Just ge generally, if you can respond to that. Okay. Um, generally, we'd be represented in something like this by the state attorney general's office, but they declined to do that because they actually were in the process of launching two of their own investigations. And when you say we, what do you the mean? The PUC itself, the organization. And at that time, we only knew of a, a, I think at the outset, we only knew about a federal investigation. And so the reasons why you do that is that the organization itself might be the target of a criminal action or a civil action. Certainly in the case of the Attorney General's office, they have a civil action underway, and that could include the CPUC. Um, <clears throat> we don't have, I'm not a lawyer, we don't have criminal attorneys. So this is somewhat new to the organization. The, the federal attorneys actually 
pointed out that some of the divisions that um, they were, that some, of the, some, of the, some of the people they were actually investigating worked for some of the divisions who might otherwise represent us. And so they asked for us to have a specific legal structure that would allow them to know that they were dealing with people who could not and would not pass on information to potential targets. So at this point, I don't know much about the matters that they're looking at. I mostly know what's in the newspapers, which may or may not be what the, what the, the investigators are looking but, at. But the PUC can't put, be put behind bars. The PUC is not an actual We can, we can actually be um, sanctioned. We can be required to make changes. But we do have an obligation to represent ourselves. Normally, that would be undertaken by the, the attorney general. I, I can cite you statute that I don't understand. Um, mm -hmm. I, can, I can actually have our lawyers or, um, uh, uh, explain it to you in greater detail. But we also have an obligation under state law to provide representation for our employees in, in, in an individual case, but as a total. So we have, as people are actually questioned who may not be targets of the investigation, they're entitled to representation. That's why I want to paid distinguish. By the state. Yeah. I do want to distinguish legal counsel as opposed to criminal representation because when somebody c commits a criminal act, they're not entitled to uh, a publicly paid. Well, even criminal. even if even if I misunderstand the question of whether or not we can be the target of a criminal investigation as an agency, which I understand that the federal government has not said that that the PUC might not be, that we they may very well levy criminal charges against the CPUC. Even if I don't quite understand that, uh, I think that we do have an obligation in the civil matter, and we have this obligation under state law to provide some form of representation for our employees, except if they are likely to be named. There, and we in have a civil matter, I, I can't. I have to agree with you, right? I have to agree with you in a civil matter, but I'm spe specifically asking about a criminal matter. Okay, well, there's a very big distinct distinction between a criminal matter and a civil matter. Civil matter does require legal representation, but to what extent have you decided, or to what extent do you have a p policy that you need to fund? The Michelle thinks she can answer it better. I, th I think I might be able to um, shed some light on this. At this point, there are investigations. There are no charges. Um, our outside counsel is assisting us in responding to those investigations. Um, there's a lot of uh, document production that has to occur in order for them to determine whether they're going to bring any charges and that sort of thing. So the outside counsel is facilitating our cooperation with those investigations. Um, that's related to document production. It's related to um, representing people who are being questioned by the investigators and that sort of thing. There's no charges at this time and there are no individuals that are named. We don't know who might be the targets or, or that sort of thing. We are, um, have the outside counsel to assist us in providing those answers to um, the investigations that are At underway. At this point, we don't know whether their requests of us are based on a civil action or a criminal action. All we know is that we can't rule that out. Okay, but do you really need legal counsel to cooperate? According to, the, to, for, according to the Federal Department of Justice, they would like for us to have somebody who is not part of the, the CPUC's legal di di discussion. They would like to have only certain of our lawyers involved in discussions with them. They are very clear on the fact they want certain information, but they don't want us to do an information dump above and beyond that. They look at that as actually an evasive tactic. And so to be able to really produce that in a way that they can then um, gain access to the information that they've asked means we have to have somebody who can help us to do that, to screen that, to look to see if there are issues that are um, confidential to our own legal processes or whether we're, we're inadvertently disclosing in ways that they may also understand confidential business information from third parties who are not the subject of the inf in, in, so. It is not easy, and we do need 
representation. And the law, in some portion of the actions that, that these attorneys are providing for us, requires us to be able to provide that, that, that criminal counsel for potential targets. We don't know. I appreciate that answer. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to get to ex parte now, because that's been uh, an issue that uh, not only has been in the press, but there has um, been uh, lots of issues that have been raised recently that do raise some valid concerns. And I, and I think uh, this is one of the issues that has contributed most to the public's erosion and the CPUC's ability to be objective and provide fair representation. And, and it does appear to be extremely skewed toward the, you know, the industries that are uh, doing business in the state under the control <coughs> of the, uh, under the regulatory supervision of the PUC. So, um, and I understand that uh, there, there isn't a current statute that requires CPUC commissioners to report ex parte communi communications. And, you know, I, I have concerns on the one hand, that having to put a requirement to disclose CPU uh, uh, ex parte communications can create kind of a, a decision among, among members to say, well, I'm not, because I don't want to disclose, I'm just not going to meet with anybody. And I think that's not the intent of the rule. The, the intent of the rule is to get commissioners out there meeting with people in the community, but to be accessible to all people who have a stakeholder interest. In the, in the regulatory services you provide. So this is an area where I have uh, become more interested in, in uh, de developing or adopting a, a policy. Uh, and, you know, the idea is to create transparency. We, we know that um, a, uh, a, a judge recently re uh, asked that uh, one of the... Um, the utilities disclose uh, communications, and that was done. And eventually, I think it was a number like uh, 46,000 or 65,000 65, yeah. communications with just one, one utility that was uh, having that level of communication. That's something that's just very difficult for me to fathom, that there's that much access to the members that's, that are discuss, discussing issues that are outside the realm of information that the public is privy to. And that, when, when you look at it to that extent, it, it, there's, it creates you know, a concern, a concern. And I think people will now have a valid concern to say, you know, what, what's going on behind the scenes here? This is information that relates to our, either our safety or our rates or our delivery of services, or where those, these services are located. I mean, are, are deals being struck behind the scenes with people in, in, a, in a way that, although, although they comply with the overall state's interests, you know, our overall goals, is this the right way to do business in the state of California? Does the CPUC intend to do something about that, either to re release the emails that you have, uh, or, to uh, develop a, a, a code of conduct for the commissioners or um, to require ex parte disclosure. This is an area that I'm very interested in working this year. Let me and I'd like to hear from you in terms of what you intend to do here and what you're willing to, to agree to, if anything at all. And uh, if you're open to working on this, uh, on this issue with me in particular, because I'm, I'm interested in you know, we've done, we did this with the uh, with, uh, Department of uh, Parks and uh, back, back then when it was uh, an issue with a commissioner where we created requirements uh, that the commissioners have a certain level of expertise, that there be a code of conduct, that there be uh, an expectation in terms of how they're going to conduct themselves. But I think it's because of the nature of the power of the PUC in particular, there needs to be something that leads to more transparency so that the public can have access to the information that you have to allow yourself to make the decisions you make. You, you're, you not only serve as policymakers, but 
judges. You're the combination of the judicial branch and the legislative branch, which is what we call quasi-judicial. So you have an obligation not only to be objective, but also to uh, uh, make, make policy. And uh, that's, that's a big responsibility that, that needs to somehow be, be uh, overseen to make sure that you're working within the confines of your, you know, I've heard of people negotiating a contractual arrangement and then bringing it before them and approving it. You're obviously gonna be biased to something that you created yourself, so what's your ability to scrutinize a document that you put together objectively? You know, and that's, uh, did I, did I, is my question too complex there? Can you no. probably take a stab at it? It's complex, but it's not too complex because we have to deal with it. Um, let me just kind of take a couple of pieces of it. And um, so th this issue of emails is really troubling for me. And I, I early on spent a lot of time reading the press accounts. I don't, I don't have access to other people's emails. I, as I, I pointed out to somebody, I don't have access to my own emails after 90 days. The, the, the Microsoft Exchange server takes them away and they, a smart IT professional would never give me the administrator codes. And so they're gone to me. But uh, I'm pretty confident that I've been careful with my own emails. But I think they fall into three different categories. There are probably um, emails that are a violation of our ex parte communications, where people are gaining information or views that are not, uh, uh, that other parties are not aware of and don't have an opportunity to counter. There are ethical breaches that may not actually be issues in terms of our ex parte communications. And then there are probably just the phenomenon, especially in, in San Francisco, that the two biggest employers in town are PG&E with something like 20,000 employees <laughs> downtown and the PUC with 1,000. And there are people who know each other. They used to work in, at the PUC before they went to PG&E. And so they are overly familiar. And so that, I think, is, a, is an issue. I don't, not, I'm, not, I'm not excusing it. I'm just saying that there's this question of what's the right comportment. And does that familiarity lead to these other kinds of, of inappropriate communications? So how do we begin to deal with that? I'm gonna turn that back to the, to the executive director in a second. But that, I think that, that what that points us to is that it's not simply a matter of observance of ex parte communication rules. The point of having a code of conduct for the commissioners is a statement that we need to hold ourselves and we need to hold each other accountable to, that it's a larger phenomenon in an agency that's generally pretty hard to understand and remote, that we really have to go far further than I would say when I was in local government or when I worked for, the, for other division departments of the state. That here, because of that quasi-judicial function, we really, really, really have to go further. And so the value to me of having a code of conduct is that the commissioners will have to discuss it and adopt it and agree to it by their own vote in a public meeting after their, everybody else comments on what we're putting to paper. That, I think, is part of the value. Then I think from that, we actually need to go back and revisit some of our other policies. And we have a, uh, a uh, attorney, an external consultant again, because I think they come at it from a much broader perspective, Michael Strumwasser, who is a, 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 an expert in regulatory law, who is looking at best practices around the US and ex parte communication. And then we have to see if we need to go further in ways that don't actually bog the process down more, but actually give people more actual satisfaction that information that we see is the same information that they see, information we're given, they have an opportunity to counter and challenge. So I think that those are two of the things that are happening at the commissioner level. I'll let um, the executive director talk about the 65,000 emails and what we're doing with them. Well, when you say further, you know at the local level at city government they have the Brown Act and that requires them to disclose every document that is produced or, you know, uh, get put in the physical 
hands. Of but only for the adjudicatory things. When I was at the city, we'd have two adjudicated issues a month in land use. And here at the PUC, every one of our agendas has 30 to 70 um, issues that have different kinds of ex parte communications rules. So that's not an but, excuse, it's just a statement. But my, that, my question was, do you uh, support something like the Brown Act for the PUC? Well, I think we have it. It's called the Bagley Keene Act, and then we have this ex parte. Which is very different. Yeah. yeah, it is different. And we have, we, have, um, we have our ex parte rules, which I think we need to really clarify. You know, but Bagley King does not go over, uh, it does not exceed Brown Act in terms of um, uh, its thoroughness. Well, um, I'm not so sure. I'd, I'd have to have a, a, an attorney answer that for me before I, I have a real conversation with you. I'm sorry yeah. to say that I can't mm -hmm. contrast the two of them. Well, I've worked under both, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you want to add to that? Uh, you know? Yes. Um, 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 those 65,000 emails were indeed shocking to the organization. And when we got them, we put them on the website just so it would be clear. And what I've done as executive director, we've created a process where four senior managers who work for divisions that weren't involved in the emails, uh, communications divisions, water division, are beginning to review the communications between util utilities and our employees. Uh, we're starting with the most senior people, the people with the highest and most powerful positions, and we're going to be reviewing them. Uh, we will then, we then plan to take personnel action consistent with the state personnel practices. Uh, we also, uh, at least at a minimum, we expect to do mandatory training in professionalism of communications, what the appropriate regulatory stance is. Uh, if you look at some of these things, uh, they're innocent, but they're also shocking. Uh, jokes about uh, scheduling lunch, uh, how many, how much, uh, uh, who's bringing the bottles of wine, uh, other exchanges, you know, basically on the, on the state's email. And what they do is they provide an over oppression of over closeness. And whatever it is, you know, it's something that shouldn't be in the emails and we're going to take steps uh, to correct it and see that uh, it isn't done again. Um, this will take some time, but we have started. We've started the review. We've put together a team to create the ethics training. And uh, I mean, it's just putting one step in front of the other. I think as executive director, we recognize that a large part of what we do depends on the trust of Californians and, and the legislators. And in some extent, we've lost it, and we have to take steps to rebuild it.